management. Um, so I've uh, seen trees all through the seasons, um, winter, spring, summer and autumn, and they, they vary um, quite a bit for, for some species, not at all for others, um, through those seasons. Um, all the pictures you'll see are ones I've taken in the Chilterns or very nearby. I'm going to focus my talk on the common, mainly native trees and a few shrubs that you'll find in Chiltern Woods and around the hedges quite commonly. I could have increased the talk by quite a few more species um, of, of native what, um, shrubs particularly, um, but I haven't done so just to try and keep it within the hour. Um, I haven't got um, pictures of ornamental trees or garden trees um, that may have been planted from anywhere in the world. I am including a few conifers um, in the middle of the presentation, which we found in, in some of the plantation woodlands around um, locally, just to give you a bit of a flavour of how to identify some of those. Um, so really, that is what I'm going to tr try and focus on tonight, to, to give you a bit of a flavour of some of the things that you look for when you're identifying trees. Um, so I'll start with the next slide. Uh, I thought I'd ask the question, what is a tree? Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully everybody um, recognises the, uh, the definition I put there. It's a woody perennial plant. In other words, um, it's there all the time. It's not an annual that dies back. Um, it's there. It's got a main woody trunk and it often grows to over six metres in height. Um, so that's a, a tree. Many of them are used for timber, um, but not necessarily. Um, but, uh, um, and a shrub is generally a lower growing bushier plant, often with multiple woody stems and is also perennial. Um, and it's not a hard and fast definition. A shrub can become a tree. In the case of a hazel or a hawthorn or a holly, you might at stages think they're shrubs, um, but a hawthorn could easily be a single stem, um, small tree. Um, probably doesn't grow much around six meters, depending on its growing conditions. So some of them I've included because they're, they're of, um, a, a bit variable, but then some of the shrubs that are common I've also included just so, so we can discuss the, the differences. And I'm mainly looking at native trees, particularly those found in ancient woods. Um, we have a relatively limited range of species in the Chilterns. Um, the beech woods are fairly dominant with beech, but there are other trees you can find in amongst them. There is regional variation in the distribution of trees in England um, due to climatic conditions, soil conditions, the local growing conditions. What's been managed, what people have cut down over the years, what, what's been allowed to regrow also has a major impact. There's also, um, the, for natural woodlands, um, what the seed sources are, what, how do the trees disperse, all makes a difference as to which trees will grow on that particular site. And the soils and the geology are major influence on, on the species. Um, whether the site is actually um, wet and floods or very dry also limits which trees will grow there. And the shrub species generally form an understory where there's enough light or are found around the edges of the woodland. So that's just a little bit of the background conditions, which is always useful to bear in mind. Um, you know, if you've got a short list of trees and we are, have got a handout which has a list of the trees that are common across the Chilterns uh, that you can look at um, th th at the end that, that um, limits the range of what you're trying to identify. Because a lot of the books have all sorts of things in. If you've got a shorter list, it always helps to, to limit to what your main options are to start with. And then if it doesn't uh, fit those, then you can look further. So next picture is um, just a, a typical autumn scene in many of the woods in the Chilterns. Um, it's famous for its autumn colours and particularly for beech woodlands. And the beech woods, I believe, have been in the Chilterns for well over, over a thousand years. But the trees weren't necessarily large trees. Uh, they may be more like the, the young growth you see in the distance in this picture. Um, historically, the woods were managed um, very intensively for wood fuel. Going back to the Norman Conquest, um, London's fuel supply was sent down the River Thames and consisted of oak and beech and things of that sort. So it could well be very young trees that have been cut down at maybe 10, 15 years growth. And that is a very different sort of situation to the ones we see today where we've got tall, smooth bark trees with, with the lovely um, bronze colours of, of, of the autumn foliage. So the first thing to do when you're trying to identify a tree is to look at the whole of the tree. Get an idea, a feel for what it's telling you about it. This is a, um, a single order by the river chest in the winter. And it's got a, a characteristic shape and a, a budding pattern and a coloration that you can use as a starting point. And then once you've uh, had a, a general impression of the tree, you can start looking at the closer details. And in winter, 
you're looking at the, the, the bud and the branching pattern, the twigs, the bark, those sort of things, and other features such as these catkins and cones that are growing on this particular one, which are typical of alder. So that particular picture shows diagnostic features for common alder um, around the children, the little um, cones that you get and the, and the, and the catkins that are developing um, and, and the, the purple buds. There are a few purple buds in that picture as well, which are again a characteristic of, of alder. So the first questions to ask really are, is it an evergreen tree, a conifer that's um, keeping its needles throughout the year? or is it deciduous? And there are some uh, evergreen trees that are broad leaves, but the only one that you like to come across uh, in the children's is holly, um, that's a broadleaf tree. Um, th there may be others like home oak that occasionally occur, but most of the evergreen trees through the winter are going to be conifers, and um, not all conifers are evergreen. The, the other picture on the, on the right there is actually a larch, and that is a deciduous conifer. Um, there are three species of larch, or three types of larch in the children's, European larch, Japanese larch and a hybrid larch and you get all of those um, but they're all deciduous trees. Um, and so the, the other question is, is it a conifer or a broadleaf tree? Uh, the Scots pine on the left hand side of this picture are a Scots pine plantation, they're a conifer, the beech on the right are a broadleaf tree. Uh, it's very introductory stuff. Um, conifers are also sometimes known as softwoods and the broadleaf trees are generally known as hardwoods. Um, but uh, that, that's uh, just a part of, of it. So that's the starting point. Um, so why do you need to know what the tree is? Um, it, it might seem that you, you want to know it down to a species level. You might want to know to a variety of le um, level. So what degree of, of accuracy do you actually need to know? Um, for today's talk, I'm talking about oaks as um, mainly English oak, but there are, um, there's a, um, the, the sessile oak in the west of England, uh, and there are hybrids of oak that are both na uh, are native, and then there are lots of other oak species that occur around the world. So what level of accuracy do you need to, to know? Uh, and to determine that, you need to start looking at the details, which are things like the leaf shape, the twig pattern, the bud shape, the colours, the hairs, whether the hairs and the twigs or hairs and the buds, um, the, the type of bark it's got, the flowers and the fruits, and some of those features are seasonal. So the, the time of year when you visit does make a, a, a difference as to what you see. You may visit a wood and not notice all the trees that are there in one go, um, just because you know for, for seasonal reasons one isn't showing up particularly well. So those are just some of the, the background things you need to start considering when you're looking at trees. So firstly, look at the whole tree. And here are two trees that are growing in what might be thought of as, as typical Chiltern beech woods. The first one on the left hand side has a blistery bark and white flowers at the top of the tree uh, in the blue sky. So this is before the beech that surround it have come into leaf. This particular tree is flowering and it's a, a, a wild cherry. The other tree on the, on the right hand side that's in full leaf is in fact an ash tree, a mature ash, again in the predominantly beech woodland. So the, when you start looking at the details of the tree, the colour of the bark, the pattern of the bark, the pattern of the branches, these are the sorts of things you, you start to do. But, with trees you've got to look up but you also need to look at what's around you on the ground uh, and the detail of the tree and a lot of the features of the tree like in this cherry might be very high up the tree you know you might have a 40 foot trunk before you're actually seeing um any any flowers any leaves at all so that can be part of the challenge so don't be afraid to look to see what's dropped off the tree and is on the ground that, that can be um, useful for getting <laughs> the, the bits and pieces you need to, to, to see and to determine things this is um, a yew tree, um, which is an evergreen, and it's a conifer, but unlike most conifers, it doesn't have a cone. It has a little red fruit, which has a, a poisonous seed inside it. Um, it is a wind-pollinated tree, so you've got the, the male flowers there, all about to shed their pollen in the spring, and they can grow to, to massive size. This The picture is in the churchyard um, up at Ibstone. So this is a several hundred, hundred year old, massive old yew tree, um, uh, that the, the, the you, you get. And, and um, the conifer has needles that have a particular flat layout o o on there. They are actually poisonous, so you don't necessarily want to be rubbing the foliage of this one. Um, they use it for cancer treatment drugs. Um, so it is collected. If you clip yew hedges, they use the, the foliage for cancer treatment. So, as I say, you want to look at the whole tree first. This is um, a tree in the winter. Um, you look at what the tree is telling you in terms of the branching pattern, 
the types of buds, the, how, how the, the buds are on the twigs. And then you look closer at the detail of the bark. And if you look again in the spring, you'll find it has leaves like this and um, the, the, the seeds which have got a, a, a sort of wing case around them. This is the witch elm, which is a tree that does grow in quite chalky conditions and is still growing quite well in many woods in the Chilterns. There's elm disease around and it will get the trees when they're maybe 30 or 40 years old, but they, some of them get to a foot or so in, in diameter. So there's some quite sizable trees, 30 centimeter diameter, um, uh, uh, sort of chest height, you, you can find elms that sort of size. They have a longish leaf, so um, they're, they're quite a long leaf, they're quite a rough leaf, and they have quite a serrated a tooth edge to the leaf. Um, so, so those are some of the features to look at. But it's also the way that they're on this, these dark twigs that are coming off at quite a, 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 a almost 90 degree angle to the twig is, is part of the pattern. I haven't got a photo of the English elm, but that's the other one you might confuse it with and there are, um, that you find in the hedgerows still. Some plants are very easy and straightforward and I hope virtually everybody can recognize that one as holly. It has the, generally has the sharp prickly leaves, although if you go higher up the tree, they may be more, um, may lose some of the spines. They become, um, they're, they're particularly prickly where animals can get to them because the trees are actually quite palatable. Um, and the female plants have berries, but they are either male or female as trees. So you'll have male flowers on some trees, female flowers and others. They don't tend to produce a lot of berries in the shade. So um, you can't always tell whether it's a male or female in the shade of a beech wood. Um, but on the edges where there's enough light, you will get uh, female flowers and, and later in the year you get the berries where it's a female plant. But hopefully most people can identify holly anyway. So there are other seasonal features to look for. The budding is one and th that's there, particularly through the winter. The leaves, if it's a deciduous tree, have fallen off, but they might still be lying on the ground. The flowers, most trees flower in the spring, but some into the summer. Um, the, the fruits, whether uh, in this case you've got conkers, and this is a horse chestnut tree, and then the colour of the tree will change through the seasons. So there are some seasonal features to look for. And this is the horse chestnut tree. Um, tree flowering, a very characteristic spike. There's nothing else uh, that grows like it with the white flowers is the, the, the common horse chestnut tree and the, um, the sort of hand-like um, leaves where they all splay out um, from, from uh, um, the, 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 the stalk. So you've got a particular characteristic of, of horse chestnut, which if you compare that, um, our next one is the, the bud of the horse chestnut. We've got a, a very large sticky terminal bud on horse chestnut. And where the leaf stalk comes off, it leaves a horseshoe shaped scar and it can grow into quite a massive tree, as you can see on the, uh, the picture of the, the whole tree there. So they're big, big trees, but they're generally planted. So they're not a feature particularly of ancient woodlands. They're a feature of the wider countryside. And um, so knowing where the tree is growing or should be growing is, is a help. Sometimes the conkers get spread into woodland so the trees can, can get there or somebody may have decided to plant them into a, a, an old woodland. And this is the sweet chestnut, the, the Spanish chestnut, um, which has a single long leaf with, again, with a very um, serrated edge and a, a, a very spiny fruit with the, the ch edible chestnuts inside. Um, uh, so a, a different sort of leaf pattern uh, and, uh, and a fruit. They're not closely related. They just happen to be both called chestnuts, um, but uh, they're not, not closely related as trees. So onto the commonest tree in the Chilterns, and um, this is the one that most of the woods have in it. Hopefully most of you can recognise it just because it is so common. Um, it is the beech. Um, the beech, as you can see from those photos, changes colours through the year. Um, it it uh, turns a lovely colour in the autumn, but has very pale green, delicate um, leaves when it opens up. The bottom right picture um, shows the beech flowering. It has the wind pollinated flowers that dangle down, down there, as you can see, shedding their pollen into the air. Then you get the developing beech mast, the, the picture above it, where the, the closed capsules of the mast. And then on the um, top top left picture um, has a, a, the actual seed developing in the, in the seed cup about to drop out. And the other key feature of a beech tree is the very long pointed buds um, that, that are a characteristic of beech. They're, they're double the length of, say, a hornbeam tree. And the, um, the beech leaves themselves are smooth to touch. There are no teeth around the edges. They have a, a, 
um, sort of almost a hairy edge when they first open and, and um, are, are palatable to insects, but within a week or two they harden off and the insects uh, um, can't get in because it was covered in wax. So it's uh, quite a waxy leaf, quite firm, um, and, and, and things to look there. And compare that with a hornbeam, which has a similar shape leaf um, and a very different flower and a very different seed. So the, the, the top um, right picture has got both male and female flowers there. The female flowers at the end of the twig with the little reddish hairs in, in the bud. There's opening and then it develops into the capsules the, that are below, the winged seeds that um, spread the, the hornbeam seed, which are, are those sort of things that droop, um, droop down. And the male catkins, as you can see, are, are tall, uh, are longer, um, stringy catkins, like, like hazel has catkins. It sheds lots of pollen into the air. The, the tree on the left is a particularly magnificent hornbeam that's taller than any other beech in a particular wood um, that I've been looking after. And rather than having a, a fairly smooth bark, it has a, a, a much more characteristic pattern with it within the trunk. So those are all things to look for, for in hornbeam and how to compare it um, with beech. The next um, common tree around is the English oak. Um, uh, there, as I said earlier, there are two main species of oak, in, um, and the one in the, the children's is nearly always Quercus robur, the English oak, um, as opposed to the sessile oak. And the difference between the two oak species is that the English oak has acorns, which you can see on the top, um, which are on a little stalk, and the, the leaves have um, not got much stalk at all. And it's the other way around with the sessile oak. It has a, the acorns are, are sh um, a short um, stalk, hardly any stalk at all, and the leaves are on a, a longer stalk with a, a, a taper from, from, the, um, from the leaf. But oak leaves are fairly characteristic. There are a number of different species. All oak species have acorns. So that's one of the characteristics of, of, of the oaks. It's got, it is a large family across the world. It produces valuable timber and the trees grow to quite a size. This is a field grown oak on the, the left hand side in winter, showing the sort of oak shape that you, is fairly characteristic with a strong mature oak tree. Um, but a valuable timber tree, um, it is quite common across the Chilterns. And it has quite a, a small brown round bud um, in, in the winter. So those are all sorts of features you're looking for. The, the, the flowers are on the oak on the, uh, on the, um, the bottom right picture, a, a long sort of catkin like um, stringy flowers in early spring just as the leaves are opening but they're only around for a week or two and this is a, a very mature oak um maybe a 300 year old tree very solid uh, branches that are coming out at you know quite quite a a, 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 um, a, a a strong angle off the tree a very um sturdy tree um and the bark as you can see there is quite quite well fissured and it's sort of gray brown uh, in, in color so there are some tree uh, features that are constant throughout the year. The bark doesn't change through the year. It changes with age of the tree, but doesn't change through the year. The shape of the tree remains the same and the branching pattern remains the same. So when you get to know a tree in the summer, you can look at it again in the winter uh, and it has the same pattern. But do also consider where it's growing uh, and, and, and what soils it's on. Oak prefers a deeper soil, doesn't really like a thin chalk soil. And one of the interesting features about where most of the ancient woods in the Chilterns are is that they're on the clay with flints cap, not actually growing on the chalk for the most part. Um, there, there are always exceptions, but for the most part, the, 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 the ancient woods cap the tops of the hills um, where it's a, a flinty soil and some clay. So I've already said with holly, you can get um, uh, set single sex trees, either male or female. You can also get some trees that have male flowers and female flowers on the same tree. And with ash trees, you can get any of them. You can get male trees, you can get female trees, you can get hermaphrodite trees. Uh, and, and with ash, they can even change their sex through their life. So they start off as male and become female over time. Um, with, in, trees in Britain are either wind pollinated or insect pollinated. If they've got catkins, they're wind pollinated, or, um, or in this case, ash is wind pollinated. If they've got showy flowers like cherry or apple, then they're insect pollinated. And with ash, one of the features to, to look for in winter is the very large black terminal bud that isn't sticky and that the buds are in pairs off to the side of it as well. So it has a branch pattern that is in pairs down, down the stem. John, just sorry to interrupt. While we're talking about ash, or you may come on to it in a minute, actually, but if you could explain a little bit about ash dieback and um, 
what we know about it and how we might spot signs of it if you well while we're on the ash slides if that's okay yeah. yep um i'll put the broken tree in to show um one of the impacts of of disease in ash not necessarily dieback but ash does cause trees to become brittle and this is showing ash bark but also brittle um the the two other pictures are really just showing the ash keys as the seeds are known they uh, bunches of, uh, of seeds one in the uh, early spring as the leaf is opening up and it's a compound leaf so it's got um 10 or a dozen leaf well uh, 11 or 13 leaflets along a, a stalk and the fungus the ash dieback fungus actually is a miniature toadstool about two millimeters high that grows on the stalk of the leaf that fell off the year before so in june or july about this time of year you might if you look very closely if you can find old ash leaf stalks you might see little white um, fungi growing there which shed millions of spores into the air and will kill off the regeneration on the ground i didn't include a picture of ash dieback maybe i should have done but um there are different signs of it and one of them is um is at this time of year all the um, leaves just shriveling up and going brown and just hanging blackened on the on the edge of a, a branch you also see a discoloration of the twigs so that it should be the gray color you see on the bottom picture those are healthy with a big black bud over time if they've got ash dieback the twig goes brown and particularly with with the regeneration it's browned off um uh, with these shriveled up leaves the other sign is on um sort of trees that are get you know 30 40 50 years old you see the canopy thinning out and particularly you see a retrenchment of the leaves so from the end of the tip and um, the, the branches back maybe a meter or two down into the stalk and the canopy instead of being green throughout is getting more and more thin and patchy maybe the leaves are getting yellower maybe getting thinner um and there's a, a general deterioration over, over years and yeah we're seeing um it's the second commonest tree across the children's and ash is in really serious problem um, at the moment and the best time to see it is from now through to um the leaves fall off in october um so yeah die back will be very common and understanding which trees are getting it is important because if they rot at the roots through secondary infections of honey fungus or get brittle and split like this one um that then they, they could go anywhere so a, a risk assessment is, is important what, what what is the ash going to hit if it falls over if it's a young sapling it's not going to hit anything or harm anything so it doesn't matter but for older trees it's very important and you know the, the key things to to be certain you're actually talking about an ash tree rather than some other tree that may have a problem is to look at the leaves and, and whether it has these keys and whether it's got a big black terminal bud that the bottom picture is showing so making sure you're talking about an ash tree is the first priority and, and, the, and if it's sickly um, then deciding what you need to do about it and if in doubt ask somebody else to have a look at it and um, put this one in for comparison um it's not really a, an ancient woodland tree it's the european walnut um that, that uh, also has a compound leaf but has fewer leaflets on it maybe seven leaflets and has the the walnut in, in those green um um developing nut capsules um the, the nut cases there um so very different to the the, the ash seed but is the one tree might at first glance mistake because it has a similar color bark um unless you look at it closely it has similar leaves at first glance in that the compound leaves on a on a stalk but the fruits are very different the um walnut timber is even more valuable than the ash timber both of them can be quite useful um, as timber trees but you do find these are around the hedges of the children's quite a lot so the next tree i put in was hazel and hazel um frequently is coppiced it's cut down to the ground and the shoots regrow and you get this multiple stem growth that's partly a feature of the management but it's also a feature of the way hazel likes to grow so it, it comes back from coppicing it regrows the shoots from the stump other trees will do that if you cut down an ash these days the regeneration is most likely to get killed off by die back quite quickly in the foreground of this the leaves i've just noticed are actually of silver birch so the the, the foreground um i haven't got birch leaves in any of the other pictures that's one of the reason i just spotted it is, is that, that is a silver birch with with um sort of triangular leaves uh, and on, off a brown stem as the tree gets older it will go white uh, and we'll see a birch bark later on um so here um hazel um, it has male catkins which hang off the, the branches very early in the year, sort of February, March time. Uh, has hairy twigs with a big reddish bud on them. And then the lower, the second bud has actually got the female flower 
uh, the on the bottom there it's got um re really small reddish um and um stamens that catch the pollen out of the air and then the hazelnut will develop from that if it's got hazelnuts on it then you know it's a hazel the hazel leaves themselves are roundish um, and got a, a softish texture when you feel them. Don't be afraid to use your hands to feel what the, the leaves feel like, because some of them feel waxy, some feel sticky, uh, and others feel leathery. You know, uh, the hazel generally feels quite soft. Some are rougher to the touch. And, and so, you know, just feeling a leaf is actually quite a good way sometimes of, of just confirming um, once you get experienced, uh, you know, what you're looking at. But they have a, a point to the leaves, as you can see on the, these ones on, on the left. Uh, there's a, a pointed tip and a, a little bit of teeth, uh, tooth, but not, not very much. The next tree you may well come across is field maple. Um, this is the native maple. Um, there, there are two others which we'll see later on that, that do occur in the children's, but the field maple is the native one. It has um, insect uh, pollination, so it's got little yellowish flowers on the bottom picture there. It has um, rounded leaves. Um, but so that they're maple shaped leaves, but rather than being pointy, they're rounded. And the, the seeds, which the upper picture shows, um, have the paired seed that are uh, um, sort of on the horizontal, they're, they're, they're rather than um, a sort of V shape that you get with, with, with sycamore. So sycamore um, trees have a, a, a pair of seeds, but the, 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 which are wing seeds to fly off in, in the air, but they're, um, they're, they're a, a different shape to these ones. And the bark of field maple um, and the trunk shape is really quite knobbly, um, as you can see on that one. Uh, 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 the, the, you get all these characteristic knobbles. Where it grows is interesting because field maple are much more likely to grow in the hedgerows and around the edges of the woodland rather than in the shade of a beech wood. It, this one's, um, you may get the odd tree trying to grow within the woodland, but many more will be around the edges. It grows very well as coppice. So if it's amongst hazel coppice, you might well find um, field maple coppice as well. So those are some of the things to, to look at, but then there are variables to, to bear in mind too. There's variations. So there's only one species of beech that's commonly grown in, in Britain, the, 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 the European beech, but it does have various color varieties. So you see copper beeches and red and purple beeches. They're just different individuals with a different sort of genetic makeup that would give them a different color. And the bark pattern can vary between trees um, and with age. So an ash bark tends to start off very smooth, but with time it gets more and more fissured and more and more character to the tree. Um, the, the same with, with other individuals. There is variation. The trees are individuals um, with their own genetics, so they're, they're not all uniform. And the management history of the particular tree um, also is quite important. You get uh, maiden trees, which are single straight stems in, in the case of beech but others that have been pollarded or had surgery done to them that have reshaped the tree and you get coppice regrowth. And if you've got coppice growth, for some species, they may have much larger leaves. I was looking at a, a pollarded walnut just uh, in town locally the other day that had been cut back really hard over the winter. Its leaves were probably three times larger than normal just because it'd been pollarded. It, the tree can then get a lot more water and resources to it. So the leaf size can really vary quite a lot. So leaf shape, um, is within a, a range, but there's variation. I remember going to Chatsworth Old Park um, up in Derbyshire once, and they had a collection of veteran oak trees. And I was amazed by the difference of English oak from one tree to the next. One or two of them had leaves that were just two inches long. The next tree might be, uh, the, 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 the leaves might be five or six times the size. And some of them were very heavily um, indented, others were almost uh, oval in shape. So there's quite a bit of variation between individuals of the same species, um, but within a range. And the size of the tree, if it's been coppiced, don't be surprised that the leaf is three or four times bigger than normal. And even on the same tree, at different parts of the tree, um, certain trees will have leaves that are double the size of another one at, at some point. So size is relevant, but only up to a point, and it depends on the management of that individual plant. So this is um, bark variation. Um, this is actually uh, up, up, up um, on Lodge Hill. Um, it's, it's a bundle planted beech. And one of the reasons we know it's bundle planted is that the four trunks that are coming out of it have different bark characteristics. So these are all beech, but they're not all the same tree. It's not one tree that's been coppiced. It is three or four trees that are growing out of the same hole um, and, and, and appear to be fused together at the base. But the tree on the left has a very different bark to the next one. 
and just with some of the range of variety within a beech tree. So it's uh, be aware of genetic variations within the species that, that, that they don't all necessarily conform exactly to type. So John, just quick, I was wondering, so the variation in bark on a beech is not through age, it's just a genetic variation? In this case, it is different individuals having different yeah. characteristics. Um, so yeah. you know, it, it's having different skin tones, if you like, mm. uh, as, a, as a result of age and different wrinkling um, uh, with age, different weathering that's been going on to it. But yeah, yeah. different individuals have different characteristics a little okay. bit with, within a spectrum. And, and yeah. this one just shows it. So, Many people would have thought that was a coppice tree to start with because it's coming out of three trunks, four trunks out of a hole. But the, the, the tree behind the, in the gap between the, the, the two smoother bark trees has a different bark to the, to the others. And it's one of the ways of um, looking at plants to see whether they look the same. I, I could have put in a, a slide from Low Scrubs where I've got a, a, a tree with maybe 15 different trunks coming out of the stump. And because they've all got the same genetic shape, the colour of the bark is the same, the pattern of the branching is the same. I assume it's the same individual that's been cut down for centuries and has regrown the same way and just got bigger and bigger and bigger over time. Yeah. And so low scrub is a fascinating place to see the extent of some of these trees. You get almost circles of, of, of characters to the same plant, plant with the same branching pattern and the next tree to it, it's got a different pattern to it. So there is variation. Um, the next few pictures, are um, examples of bark, um, the colours and textures you get in a mature tree. A young oak has relatively smooth bark, um, a young ash certainly has smooth bark, but here are the two side by side, and the oak bark is a bit more flaky, a bit browner, uh, and the ash is quite quite heavily fissured. Um, but these do, as the tree ages and goes from you know, a 30-year-old tree to a 50-year-old tree to a 100-year-old tree to a 300-year-old tree, that gets more and more character, more and more um, lived in, as it were, uh, w w with age. So that, that's um, the differences between uh, oak and ash bark. And we've got a chart of bark types that you can have as a handout or, or um, uh, that can be available at the end of the, the talk. And these are some other bark patterns that are really quite characteristic. The sweet chestnut, the Spanish chestnut we talked about earlier, has um, very much a spiralling pattern of bark and a, and a sort of hatching pattern as well. Um, the London plane, which isn't an, a native tree to, to the Chilterns, um, has bark that peels away, revealing sort of interesting little patterns, almost like lichen growth on it, but it's just the way the bark's flaking off, revealing a whole series of patterns underneath. Then here are two more. This is the very brown, flaky bark of sycamore and aspen trees, which have um, lenticels, which are breathing pores in the trunk. All trees breathe through the leaves, exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide but many also breathe through the trunk and some of them do it through these um, lenticels the pores in the trunk and aspen has a particular diamond shaped pattern um, of, of pores to, to help the tree um, to, to breathe basically exchanging um, oxygen and carbon dioxide with the atmosphere and here's some more trees with, with lenticel patterns there's the the, the gunmetal color of the, the white beam um, this is really quite an old tree with, with blistering lenticels. And then there's lime, which also has a, a, a you know, shiny metallic but, bark, but with a, a different pattern of, of these breathing pits um, in, in the trunk. So the regular markings within the tree that are fairly diagnostic. But um, this is an example where you can get other things that hide what the tree is at all. Um, so this is actually an ash tree, but the amount of lichen growth, you may get moss growth or, or, or algal um, green slime on the tree, can disguise the bark. So it's not always something that's clear. The yellow and the blues there are all different lichens that are growing on the surface of this particular tree, and they're masking the underlying um, bark pattern. So a few more um, leaves. This is the aspen, um, a type of poplar and it's the, the main native poplar that grows in sort of commons and the heaths on the, on the sandier, wetter soils, perhaps on, 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 the, on, the, on the, um, the plateau of the Chilterns and, and elsewhere as well. Um, it, perhaps a tree that will be planted more um, in the future. And one of the features of it in the, the summer, in the breeze, is that the, the leaves tremble. Um, they, they, they make a rustling noise in the wind, you can hear them, uh, and you can see them. They're on quite a, a longish stalk and they hang and tremble. And, and they're an unusual shape um, uh, for, for a poplar leaf. They're, they've got this sort of, sort of round serrated edge, if you like, and sometimes they're almost octagonal in shape. 
Then this is uh, down in Aylesbury Vale. Um, this is the, the native black poplar. And one of the features of black poplar is the way that the, the, low, the limbs can um, have this um, sweeping, curving branch that, that, that comes out. This one's probably been pollarded in the past, but it has big sweeping branches. This one's going yellow in the autumn. And these are the leaves, um, are very different to the aspen shaped leaf. It's much more of a triangular pointy leaf. And in the, um, the winter, that's the budding pattern of the, the, the native black poplar. So they're alternate along the twig, long pointy buds on a short stalk. And the, the tree next to it is a, a pollard that's beginning to, to sort of collapse and fall apart. And it was before we actually did some work to try and rejuvenate the trees um, by, by actually getting them repollarded, uh, which hopefully prolongs the life of the tree um, e even further. So that's the native black poplar. There are also hybrids of poplars which you find um, around the place that have been put in plantations. So the native black poplar tends to be in a hedgerow like this one um, and with, with these big sweeping branches, whereas a plantation black poplar um, and there are various clones um, are normally regularly spaced across a plantation, uh, often in fairly wet ground. This is a, just to show more twigs with, with budding patterns. This is the, the goat willow, the sallow, where the buds are again um, generally alternate along the twig and lying quite flat tight to, to it on a, a little little bul um, bulge in the twig that holds the bud. So these are, if you're looking at plants in winter, these are the sort of features you're looking for, the colour of the bud, how it's fixed to the tree, are they in pairs, are they alternate, are they uniformly around the twig? Uh, and uh, yeah, things of that sort. And then sure. this is the, the sallow in winter. Yep. Just a quick question. Um, sorry, do you want to finish it? While you're on sallow, finish off and I'll come back actually because it will probably uh, throw you off uh, track. Yeah. This one we're just going to show the, the buds of sallow early in the spring, um, which again attract insects. This one, um, it, 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 you might think it's wind pollinated, but they actually attract quite a lot of insects to them and very furry um, uh, uh, flower buds um, on, on the sallow. So yeah, that was it, Nick. Want to ask a question? Yeah, a question from Caroline asking. Go back to this slide you talked when lichen on the on the trunk. Just asking, yep. does lichen or ivy growth affect how well trees can use trunks to breathe? I guess does it I don't think it makes any difference. Yeah. No. Um, the only time that anything growing on the tree causes harm in terms of algae or, or lichen or moss seems to be when they're in a tree shelter. And the, the 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 plant growth, the algae or the the mosses on the on the young tree in a tree shelter can hold a, a film of water tight to the the tree guards, so the trees actually drown in the guards. I've seen it happen with oaks and wild cherries that have been left in their plastic tubes for too long. That is quite a common cause of death: is neglect of the tree by not removing the tree guard. Um, but other than that, I'm not aware of anything of that sort ever causing problems in normal growing conditions. It's just trapping water close to the tree um, and, and that causes it to drown and rot off. So the next one again is probably uh, either along stream sides or in the Aylesbury Vale is the crack willow and this is a, a recently pollarded willow that's probably only a, a year or two of new growth but it shows the long pointy leaves you get with willows um, uh, 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 of the crack willow and also the, the, the white willow, which is a similar species. And again, the, the, we've got the, the, the flowers next to it there on the stalk. Early in the spring, before the tree comes into full leaf, um, you've got these long, long um, flowers that, that uh, are produced. And the trees produce a very um, wind dispersed, fluffy seed, the white seed that can spread around it in, in, in the, the summer. So the next tree is lime. Um, lime may well be a tree that's planted more in the Chilterns with, with climate change and the problems of damage by grey squirrels and things of this sort. Lime is generally a fairly smooth bark tree as a young tree, but it gets more and more fissures with, with, as it ages. Um, it has flowers, you can see from the, the top picture. It has a heart-shaped leaf um, and it has a slightly um, toothed edge to the leaf. It's, a, it, it's an interesting texture and then the, the picture at the bottom I hope you can see the rounded fruits that hang they're, they're not related to the, the citrus limes at all um, but just happen to have the same name but they're a hard little um, rounded seed on quite a long stalk that develops um, in, in the summer so that, that's lime most of the limes in the Chilterns are like to be small leaf limes the um, large leaf lime is a, a tree of the west of England 
but uh, the, the tree planted in avenues and in parks quite frequently may be a hybrid lime. Um, and there are other species of lime from around the world that are also being planted in parks and gardens. So limes can be quite a complicated one. Um, it almost needs a hand lens to look along the twigs to see how hairy the, the, the twigs are for, for actually identifying them by species. Um, leaf size is another, uh, is another clue. But the, the hybrid lime but is a hybrid between large and small leaf lime and is naturally occurring and quite widely planted. Um, and I don't think it's good for bees. I think small leaf lime is very good for bees, very good for wildlife. I think the hybrid lime may have problems and, and certainly one or two of the other species of limes are not so good for bees. They, they, um, uh, so it, putting the right tree in is important. And John, am I right in thinking with lime, you, in mature trees, you quite often get that a lot of young growth coming right from the base of the trunk? I think that's quite frequently on the hybrid lime. On the um, hybrid. But also lime does coppice very well. Um, lime was traditionally coppiced. The bark was used for rope making. It's got very, very fibrous bark. And the timber was used for carving. Um, it's a very soft wood that's very good for carving. So um, the things like misery cords in churches and panelling in churches was often uh, lime because you could carve it into nice, uh, interesting shapes and uh, held it well. Okay. A couple of questions. So we'll see from... one... Sorry, John. Yep. A couple of questions from the floor before you move on to Cherry. Okay. Um, Oh, so Stephen's asked about the, what, um, what the connection between lime planting and grey squirrels. I think you, you said they're almost implying they're almost resilient to that. Uh, they are a tree that generally um, the grey squirrels don't damage the, the main trunk bark. They may damage the, the, the side branches, but one of the problems we've got with beech and oak and hornbeam and birch and field maple and some of the other trees, native trees and children's, is grey squirrels strip the bark from about age eight to about age 40 plus. And if that ring barks the main trunk, then that tree is pretty useless as a timber tree. Many die because they've been ring barked. Um, so as an alternative with a changing climate, lime is thought to be a tree that would do better. And it seems to have a, a bit of, it's not one that the squirrels regularly attack the, the trunk. So it, it might be because it's so fibrous, it, it can get away better. This is another tree, the wild cherry, that, um, that has a bark that the squirrels don't seem to like. They, they, they learn certain trees and like the flavour of some of them. They seem to be going for the sugary sap below the bark um, in the spring, from sort of late May through to late July, maybe a little bit later, um, they will strip the bark. And then with beech trees in the early part of the spring, they're stripping the upper branches in the canopy and you can get rained on by strips of bark falling on you. Um, when they're going for the sugars that are being produced at the top of the tree, by September, they're at the bottom of the tree ripping holes in the base of the tree, even on mature trees, to get at the sugary sap. So it's often thought to be young, young squirrels that are dispersing, that have a, a, a sugar fix, you know, like, like Coca-Cola fix or something with teenagers. It seems to be the same with grey squirrels. They're going for the sugars in the tree during the spring and summer, stripping the bark, ring barking it, and it's the number of um, squirrels attacking trees year after year after year that's the problem. Um, but some trees, like the wild cherry and the lime, um, don't seem to get damaged more. Uh, Sadly, wild cherries are prone to other diseases, um, viral diseases and, and, and fungal disease and bacterial diseases. So the number of cherries we should grow is limited. Um, but these are the characteristic of it. It has a lovely white flower in the, in the spring of this pattern. Um, if you're sold bird cherry, which I think Prunus avium was, it has a, a leaf, a flower which is on quite a spike and multiple flowers on a spike. Um, and it's a smaller tree that grows in the north of England. It's not native to the Chilterns particularly. So it's a native tree, but not native to the Chilterns. And here you see the cherries. Um, and the rootstock of the wild cherry was used in the cherry orchards for, for grafting um, other varieties to, to grow in the orchards where you wanted to, to have a cultivated variety. You took a graft of a cherry you liked the flavour of, of and then put it onto a wild cherry root and it, it would grow into a big orchard tree. And there are a large number of varieties around the children's of, of different types of cherries that were grafted onto trees like that. Question so this John, is the silver birch. Question, sorry, question John is coming from Julie asking about when you referred earlier about the, uh, the tree guards, the removal of tree guards. Um, question Julie about when's the best time to remove a tree guard? I, I guess when's, it, when's it's deemed safe and best to take them down? It depends what the problems are, why you've got the tree guard there. If you've got a lot of deer, you might want to leave it quite a long time, but you don't want to leave it any longer than the tree fills the, um, the guard. When the tree starts to get close to the guard, it's harder to get off. Most of the tree guards these days have a, um, a spiral, uh, have a, 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 a breakage point 
lasered into them so that the plastic should split along that line and you can rip them off but you don't want to let them grow so they're too tight to the tree so you if uh, the tubes vary because in in diameter because they come in nests so you get four or five guards uh, fitting in one inside another so it, it varies from the tree guard to tree guard an individual tree how will how long you have to leave it um but it might be seven or eight years it might be a little more depending on the growth of species but it also depends on the problem. If you're trying to protect the tree from deer damage, you might need to leave them longer and just split them down one side to make sure that the, the, the air can get in and, and water can get out. Um, uh, but, but yeah, uh, deer are the big problem for why tree guards are so common in the children's. Great, thanks John. Uh, this is silver birch and the only picture I put uh, of, of the silver birch in uh, is the one with this uh, white bark. Um, it's the only native tree that has a white bark. There are other birches from around the world that are planted in gardens and Betula alba being one that also have a, a white bark that peels um, but they're sort of garden varieties it also in winter has a, a purplish um canopy for from all the buds are a purple color so you get this white with purple these these pictures are showing um, there's a second species of birch that isn't very common in the children this is a downy birch and you're looking quite closely at the shape of the twigs and how hairy and spotted the twigs are to separate the two. So for the most part, if they've got the white bark, it's like the silver birch. If it's got a purple bark, it might be the downy birch. Um, but you're looking at the, the, the twig pattern um, you know, for, for, for hairs and spots on the, on the twigs and things of that sort to, to actually tell them apart. So we've been talking mainly about native trees that are grown from seed for the most part. Um, it's very important to recognise the fact that people have been planting trees from all over the world um, in this country for quite a long period of time, particularly in gardens, but also in parkland. And, and there are some, um, quite a, a few thousand hectares of commercial timber plantations, uh, which generally are limited to a few species of mainly conifer trees. So I'm going to show a few of those very quickly now, um, just before we go on. So trees have been introduced from around the world. This is a good example. This is a Latimer in a um, parkland sort of setting. You've got giant redwoods, um, you've got Douglas fir, you've got larch, you've got um, western red cedar, Lawson cypress, all those sort of things planted wherever somebody's decided to put them into a collection. So you've got pines, and this is the two commonest pines in the children's the, the black pine, which is on the left, which is a very strong, large tree, but susceptible to um, a, a fungal disease now. Um, grows to a huge size in terms of timber um, and uh, has long needles in pairs. And then there's a Scots pine, which is the native pine of Scotland, it used to be native in England, um, isn't probably native to the children's at the moment, but has an orange bark and shorter um, needles again in pairs. So this is a close up of the Scots pine needles with the, the, the flowers, the, 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 the um, male flowers about to shed all their pollen uh, and then the cones will develop um, later on from, from, from the female flowers. So a pair of needles, but other species of pine from around the world may have needles in threes or in fives. So you can look on the, on the ground or on a low growing branch and just count the, the needles to see whether they're in pairs or pull them off whether they're in threes or fives. You know, so there's the, the, some, some things looking for. There's um, Western hemlock and here are Western hemlock with the characteristic bark pattern and natural regeneration. It's a very prolific tree um, when it's on the right soil, it will re regenerate very freely. And there's a bit of a weed in that respect. But that's a close up of the, the, the foliage of the Western hemlock. It has two sides um, of needles that are growing fairly flat um, uh, um, to, to, to the, the stem. And they compare that with Norway spruce, which has needles that grow all around and quite spiky uh, when, when you feel them. And, and a, 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 quite a strong smell of um, resins from, from pine. So you, the sense of smell is quite important with conifers, what they smell like. Um, this is the Wellingtonia, the giant redwood, um, which has, uh, as you can see, the, uh, a, a quite a, a complex foliage and really quite large um, uh, cones on it. So the cones are, can be very diagnostic and it, you may find those on the ground, which can help uh, to work out what the trees are. And this is cedar. A, 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 a blue atlas cedar with um, very large cones upright on the on the a woody branch. So that's just giving you a quick flavour of some of the, the conifers. The last two are larch, which has little cones and and actually has red flowers. The um, Japanese larch has green flowers, so that's one of the ways to tell them apart. And western red cedar is also very commonly planted and is a chalk tolerant conifer. Um, with um, uh, with, with uh, you can see on the right with reddish bark and uh, complex um, 
droopy foliage. And so I say smell is quite important for selling conifers. So that's a little bit of an interlude really from all the native trees. There's something else you might, you might see um, growing around the place. So back to, to other common trees. This is the sycamore in spring. So it's a maple leaf. It's a European tree. The only reason we probably haven't got it in England as a native tree is because of the, the, the English Channel developing after the Ice Age. It would have probably got here on its own. Um, yeah, it's a um, long dangling flowers there uh, and then the wing seeds in pairs similar to the field maple except the, more of a v-shape run uh, on, on the horizontal and similar to that there's another tree that is quite common around the Chilterns is the Norway maple this is an autumn color but has a much more pointy leaf more delicate um, feel to it a different sort of feel when you actually hold it in the hand um, a reddish stalk in many cases but uh, both those maples are, are really quite common in, in woods and the children's, particularly ones that have been planted. A tree of the chalk is the white bean, um, which has white leaves, particularly in spring, round leaves, quite a good size to them, nice um, white flowers, and then these little apple-like fruits uh, that develop, they go redder and then browner uh, as they age. Um, but uh, this is one that you may well come across on the chalkier soils in, in the children's. This is the rowan or mountain ash, which like the, um, the English ash has a, a compound leaf, but in this case it has 13 to 15 leaflets. There's a difference too, and a little bit more tooth as leaves as you can see there, has red berries um, in, in the autumn uh, and a very different sort of bark, which I haven't got a picture of, but it has a different bark. And then this is a natural hybrid of those two trees. This is one I found in Bottom Wood that has been growing from a, a seedling, is now about 10 years old, and this is what might be called an intermediate um, white bean, a, a, a natural sorbus, a natural hybrid between rowan and white bean. And the, the other two are next to it. And this is the rarer tree um, of the ones that are native tree. This is the wild service tree, um, which grows in Burnwood Forest particularly, and one or two woods in the children, but really quite scarce, an ancient woodland indicator, almost a maple-like leaf and a brownish, um, a berry when it produced them, similar to the, um, the, the, the white bean fruits, but brown um, in, in clusters hanging off the tree uh, from, from the flower. So one to look out for. The timber is really quite valuable if you get it. Crab apple, um, nice apple flowers, small hard green fruits in, in, in twos and threes, a roundish leaf um, and a really quite a coarse bark as you can see. Um, you find these occasionally in ancient woodlands, you know, just in, in fairly small numbers because they're a tree that actually keep their distance from the neighbour. And then on to a few shrubs just quickly. Um, blackthorn flowers in April, um, has really quite long spines, but relatively few of them. But when you catch one, they're, they're quite, quite nasty. Insect pollinated, plum-like fruit, the, the sloes, rounded leaves and, um, and purplish twigs uh, are things to look for there and compare that with the hawthorn which flowers a bit later normally in may which is another name for the common hawthorn um, it has uh, these reddish seed uh, berries with a single seed in it they have one ovary that's why it's called monogyna so the, the common hawthorn uh, has one seed and the comparison is with the, the midland hawthorn which is the ancient woodland tree which has two seeds in it um, so if you crush the berry of midland hawthorn you should find two seeds and if you look at the flower parts of, of the Midland Hawthorn, they have two ovaries um, as opposed to one. So it is looking really quite technically at the flowers to tell them apart. But the leaf pattern, as these ones show, tend to be on, on the Midland Hawthorn, quite a bit glossier. And um, the shape is, um, it has a much more tapered um, end to it rather than a maple type leaf, um, which I'll show in a minute on this one. So that's a common Hawthorn, but it's a cultivated variety. Um, probably called Paul's Double Scarlet or something of that sort. It's a double flowering hawthorn and it's a, a, a red variety. But the, the leaves there are typical of the, the common hawthorn um, compared with these ones of the Midland hawthorn. So you're looking at quite technical details as you, you go on for some of these species. Um, a few more shrubs. This one I, um, I put in because it's uh, really quite easy to, to, to spot. The, the flowers are on the left-hand side, very pale yellowy green flowers. Um, on um, yellow twig, uh, on green twigs rather, uh, often squarish twigs. Um, and this is the spindle, spindle tree, but it doesn't grow to a very great height. It's probably under six meters tall, often multiple stem. And it has 
um, these pink fruits, but the actual seed inside is orange. So when they burst open, there's an orange seed in it. Um, so, so that's spindle. And we've got um, two viburnums here that are typical of the chalk. Um, the wayfaring tree with large leathery leaves and then the gelder rose with more of a, a delicate maple-like leaf. And that's the difference between the flowers and, and, the, and the fruits of those two particular viburnum species. Um, last few pictures coming up now. The, these ones just showing some of the variety in tree shape. These are both beech trees. The one on the right is a typical tree that's grown maybe for 100, 150 years from a seed. It's called a, a maiden tree. It's um, a, a tall, straight stem. The one on the left may be quite a bit older um, and is a, a pollarded beech, as you find on some of the commons. I think this might have been taken on natural common, where the tree has been cut above the height of grazing animals for fuel, and then there's regrown and sent up new shoots and has been recut and recut and recut over the years. So you get quite an old tree. And this next one was the, the beech I was thinking of when I said um, about a tree that had been um, cut down repeatedly. That is one tree of beech that's been repeatedly coppiced up at low scrubs. There are actually bluebells in the foreground of that picture, um, just to give it a bit of scale. So this is um, a tree that's all come from the one stump uh, and they've all got the same sort of growth habits. So I think if you did the D DNA test, you'd find the tree at both ends of that clump were the same plant. And that's what beech seedlings start off like. So if you see these little leaves, they're probably too late in the year for them now. These are the, the cotyledons, the seed leaves of, of a beech tree. It looks nothing like a beech leaf to start with. And then the next leaves that develop are the, the typical beech leaves. So you may well see on the ground early in the spring, a, a carpet of beech leaf, leaf litter, the, the capsules there, which you've got, and some of the, the beech mast as well, and then the seedlings starting to develop. So that's looking down at the, the floor of a beech wood as to what you might start to see as the next generation of beech trees. Sadly, the pigeons and the mice and the voles eat most of these, but if you're lucky and there's a bit of protection, some of those will get away and the next generation of trees starts to grow. And that's what a young lime seedling looks like. So nothing like the heart-shaped leaf of lime, but um, this is naturally re regenerating lime in a woodland. Um, the leaf is probably the one that's full of all the holes on the side there um, where, where the insects have gone because these are, uh, are leaves that disappear quite quickly. The beech leaves last for, for um, you know, three or four seasons, whereas the, the lime disappear over the first winter. But those are the, the cotyledon leaves of lime starting to develop. So there are some, you know, trees vary through their life. And, the, and the, these are a couple of examples where the, the first leaves of the, of the tree don't look anything like the tree as it develops later. Um, one of the, the final ones of interest is an evergreen shrub, the box um, that we had a major project on across the Chilterns. This shows one of the larger trees we came across as a box tree, um, probably three or 400 years old. Um, the timber can be extremely valuable. This is the most valuable timber we've sold in the Chilterns. Um, we've sold some at, um, I think it was six pounds a kilogram for printing blocks and went up to Newcastle, the specialist buyer there. So that's 6,000 pounds a ton. Um, most timber is measured, uh, you know, 50 or 100 pounds a ton, maybe a little bit more if you're lucky. Uh, it, it's fairly typical. Oaks, uh, another one that's valuable, but might be a thousand pounds for a good quality oak tree for timber. This box is worth 6,000 pounds, so don't just cut it down to waste. Um, you, it, it's a problem. It has very interesting flowers, as you can see on the bottom picture, and even more interesting seed capsules. These are the ripening little cauldron like uh, pods you get, which then split at each of those three poles dries out and opens up and it sheds the seeds and it grows quite well on chalk scree type soil. So we've got some of the largest native boxwoods in the country in the Chilterns and so it's a plant you might come across on, on chalky soils. So why do you need to know all this? Well if you're planting trees you want to know what you're planting and this is a, a typical delivery of trees and tree guards that I, I get in, in, in the winter and I want to make sure I'm planting the trees where I want them. So in here we've probably got hazel, lime, wild cherry, there's some western red cedar, um, I think there's some ash as well possibly at the time because we're no longer planting ash but those sort of species and some field maple and you get this bundle of twigs and you have to sort them out so it's one of the reasons why you need to know what the trees are if you're doing work in the woods and this is um, new growth just to show how things grow so this is a wild cherry uh, growing in a tree shelter um, it, I think it's possibly in its first year it's come out of the tube within about six months 
and then there's an oak on the on the, the right hand side. Um, the planted there's little transplants, um, just a few inches high, and then they shoot up maybe a meter of growth or more in the first year. And this is the, the other end. This was an old oak uh, uh, on the Bullstrode Hill Fort, um, Oak Jared's Cross, described as being very old in 1847. This tree was actually bricked up in 1900 because he had found the brick with the date on it, 1900 that dropped out. It's still alive today, 120 years after it was bricked up, and, and uh, so nearly 180 years after it was described as being very old, but it's still hanging on. Um, so you know, trees change their shapes and characteristics over time. And that's one of the, the interesting things about them. They, they don't remain constant, but certain things will. The leaf shape um, of the oaks will remain the same. The acorns remain the same on, on an oak tree. And you can tell some trees from the distance in the landscape. So particularly in the spring and in the autumn, you can start to pick out the trees. At first glance, most people would think this was a beech wood and the beech is the sort of main purpley tinge, but you've got the, the Douglas fir, the tall conifers in the background. You've got the larch, the pale green conifer in the foreground. In front of those, there's a whole hedgerow of witch elm, which are flowering. There's wild cherry with the white white blossom on it. There's an oak at the back that, that's there. So there's a, 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 a yew tree or two possibly as well. So a whole mixture of different trees you can pick out in the landscape when you, you get used to looking at things. And yeah, main thing is get out, enjoy the woods, try and sort out what you've got growing there. In many cases, it is mainly one species, the beech, but you will find other trees growing amongst them. And remember to look down as well as up. What's on the, on the ground around your feet can be quite a useful clue. These are all hazel leaves that are dropped off um, in the winter. So th th there are clues at your feet as well as at the top of the tree. And if you want more information, um, the, a couple of um, examples, There's, Woodland Trust has an app you can put in your phone called British Trees that you can download through the App Store. Um, it is quite a useful introduction. It doesn't have all the native species on yet, but hopefully it will do. They also have a website with that link to the British Trees, Native Z of British Trees, um, and that's useful. And there are other, other things um, you can find too. I'm going to leave with a final slide, which are a few of the guidebooks I use. Um, you get tree information in other floras too, but these are specialist guidebooks. Um, uh, some of them are current and some are uh, sort of older classic books like the Mitchell um, Field Guide to Trees. Uh, it depends which one suits your purpose. Some are very good for, for drawings and others are good with photos. Um, some have a layout you might like, others um, a, 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 a group by the individual tree. So it depends which ones you, you fancy using. And, it's useful sometimes to have a mixture of different books so you can um, check through. But um, that, that, that's uh, just a few examples of, of guidebooks. Some are very small and can be carried around. And I've got some much more expensive books than that. I wouldn't want to take out the house um, that are, are giving descriptions of trees and their uses. Um, but those, those are, uh, are more about the information about the tree rather than the, how to identify it. So that, that, I hope, is a quite a, a quick whistle stop um, around some of the native trees and shrubs you like to find in the Chilterns. John, that's fantastic. Thank you very much for that. We've covered a, a lot of ground in an hour and a quarter there. So, so brilliant. Thank you very much. Question from Julie that I haven't quite picked up on yet. Going back to your slide around spindle. Um, question another. Well, so when the kids used to call them mini pumpkins, would that be the same? Yes, it's the kind of the old colloquial names or the old kind of local names for things. But um. the the Flora Britannica by Richard Maybe is a very good place to look up the, these sort of folklore type names and uses. So yeah. that's another book I've got on the shelf that um, is a very good one for for the local names. Some of these species, you know, depending which county you're in, may have all sorts of different local names for them. And Certainly some of the local craftsmen will call a tree one thing uh, 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 and other people think of it as something totally different. So yeah, there are different names for it. Um, even the scientific names, everyone says, well, you should be using scientific names. Uh, they, they get revised, particularly now people are doing DNA tests of trees. So the, the science uh, uh, finds the relationship of the trees aren't, and the shrubs aren't quite what they thought. And it's even more so with a lot of the flowering plants. So. Mm -hmm. um, they say if you're using a scientific name, hopefully people in other countries can identify it, but these things aren't necessarily fixed in stone when they, they do DNA tests and find the tree was actually related to something we didn't think it was. Yeah. Um, so they, they reclassify them. Right. And question from Colin, John, if you can. Um, John is ask, he's asking which woods or which kind of type of wood would you find the wild service tree? Um, 
Do you, I think you the best have place I, I know is is um, the, the the Forest Mission Burnwood Forest. Um, if you go out into the Vale, okay. the Forest Mission Woods on uh, uh, there, there are a large number of wild service tree there. Um, it was growing in a mixture of Norway spruce, which they felled. That the the Forest Mission went in the wisdom in the 60s, spread the ho uh, sprayed the whole wood with Agent Orange, um, the 245C, to, to kill off the native trees to try and grow the conifers better, um, despite it then being made into a nature reserve for butterflies. Um, mm -hmm. They failed, and the oaks and the wild service tree have come back, fortunately, um, and they've now been removing the Norway spruce that they planted. Um, but that, that's one of the best places I know to, to see them, that anyone can visit. Great stuff. Thanks, John. And uh, there's no more questions on the chat, but if anyone else has any, if you want to um, and a final call for any kind of questions before I wrap up. 